The Christian festival of Epiphany on January the 6th reminds us of different responses to the Christmas story, recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. The first response is that of Herod. King of the Jews? Herod was the king of the Jews. And in verse 3 it says, Herod was disturbed, deeply disturbed, deeply troubled. Later on, when he realised that he had been outwitted by the wise men, we read, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. It was not for nothing that he was known as Herod the Great. Because of the Christmas story, we've tended to make him into a pantomime character, the baddie that we all boo at when he comes on stage. But that's a caricature. He was very rich and he could be extremely generous. He was an excellent administrator and he showed great loyalty to Rome. He was politically astute, managing to keep in with successive Roman emperors. He ran a superb famine relief program and he initiated a number of great building projects, one of which was the temple at Jerusalem. However, he suffered from paranoia, and in his later years, illness made it worse. He was subject to fits of rage and insane jealousy. He became very cruel, and if he didn't trust people, even those closest to him, he killed them. He was so suspicious that he killed his favourite wife, Mariamne, and her mother and at least two of his own sons. The Roman Emperor Augustus said that it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be his son. Everything we read about him in the Bible matches what we know of him from other historical sources. A cynical politician who would stoop to any level to hold on to power. He was the epitome of Lord Acton's famous quotation Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes, Herod the Great, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. The first approach he tried was the iron fist in the velvet glove. Yes, I'd like to come and worship him too. But when that didn't work, he lost his temper and threw the velvet glove away. Anger turned to murder, and there was weeping and great mourning. Herod's response reminds us that in our world today, there are similar personalities wielding similar power. Persecution, torture, and unspeakable atrocities are committed against believers, and their lives are in constant danger. You may be like Herod. You're saying to yourself, why am I listening to this? Perhaps it all seems alien and all you want to do is to leave Christmas behind. In reality, you couldn't be farther from God. If that's the case, then know this, that it's no accident you're watching. You may not be seeking God, but God is seeking you. He sent Jesus to save you from the worst parts of your life and to enrich and bless the best parts of your life. There is only one person who can forgive your sins, mend your past, remould your future and give you peace. And that person is Jesus. The second response to the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2 is that of the Magi. 
after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Who were these men? They were pagan priests, influential in their own culture, probably from Babylonia, a kind of cross between astrologers and magicians. They weren't quite Russell Grant, but they weren't Professor Brian Cox either. The only other place this word appears in the New Testament is Acts chapter 13, where it's translated sorcerer. Magi used the position of the stars to interpret events. Saturn represented Palestine and Jupiter represented the universe. And it's quite likely that it was a conjunction of these two planets in 7 BC that first made them think something of great significance was happening, not just for the Jews, but for the world. Astrology was all they had, but that was enough, and they came. They travelled hundreds of miles on such scant information that they had to start from scratch with their inquiries when they arrived. And who did they turn to? Of all people, Herod, the psychopath, the tyrant, the man whose insane insecurity was a very real threat to any potential rival. Had they been less important people, they might not have got out of Herod's palace alive. But they were important. Their murder could well have sparked a serious international incident. Besides that, they had their use. They could lead Herod to his rival, whoever that might be, and it wouldn't be too difficult to put an end to a newborn child. And so, led by the star, they came to the house where Jesus was. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Their response was to worship the newborn king. And that worship was expressed in two ways. Firstly, they bowed down. They humbled themselves. Human pride is always an obstacle to true worship. The second way in which they expressed their worship was in the giving of gifts. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. Commentators have looked for particular meanings in these different gifts, but it's doubtful if the Magi had any such meanings in mind. Rather, these were the kind of valuable gifts which would be expected when making a royal visit. Two aspects of worship, and they are both costly. Humility is costly to our pride and giving is costly to our pocket. The response of the Magi, which brought them hundreds of miles to find Jesus, was expressed in worship, the key elements of which were humility and generosity. We need to measure our worship against that. The Magi had been unsure where to look. Herod had no idea where to look. And so he turned to the chief priests and teachers of the law, and they did know exactly where to look. Without hesitation, they quoted from those Old Testament prophecies in Bethlehem in Judea, as the prophet has written. And so the wise men journeyed on, and Herod made his evil plan. But what about those religious leaders? What did they do? absolutely nothing. The Magi, with only a star to guide them and hundreds of miles to travel, made the journey and found the Christ child. The religious leaders, with full knowledge of the scriptures and only a few miles to travel, did precisely nothing. Think of a village about five miles from where you live. 
That was the distance from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. When Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, he was writing to a very mixed bunch of people. Some of them were Jews and many of them were not. In chapter 2, he highlights the differences between these two groups, but goes on to say, Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Some people were far away and some were near, but Jesus came for both. It's obvious what category Herod fell into. He was definitely far away and because of his response he stayed that way. Similarly, the Magi were far away. They were not Jews. They were not living in Palestine. They were not schooled in the Jewish religion. Quite the opposite. But they had a hunger for truth and God led them to Jesus. They were brought near. And then there were the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They were not far away. They were near near spiritually as well as geographically. They were descendants of Abraham. They had the scriptures. They had the covenants. They had the promises. They were so near. And yet, because of their response, or perhaps we should say their lack of response, it was a case of so near and yet so far. It's possible you're like Herod. You may not be seeking God, but God is seeking you. He sent Jesus to save you from the worst parts of your life and to enrich and bless the best parts of your life. There is only one person who can forgive your sins, mend your past, remold your future and give you peace. And that person is Jesus. He came to bring peace to those who were far away. But to know that forgiveness and peace, you must come as the Magi did. Come in humility. Come and offer yourself completely. Hand over your life to the King, King Jesus. Again, it's possible that you're like those priests and teachers of the law. You can be full of knowledge about Jesus in your head and have no desire to give him a place in your life, content with religion and missing out on Jesus himself, the way, the truth and the life. Whether you're near or far away, what is your response to King Jesus? Does he rule your life? Is your life a kingdom of joy and peace, righteousness and truth, love and hope? Is your life a kingdom where Jesus is the king? Or is your life a republic where you are the president? What is your response to the message of peace in Jesus?